How knoweth this man letters? If they knew the answer to that, they would know that he was God the Son. John chapter 7, verse 15, and the Jews marvel. They didn't say he didn't know letters, they just want to know how did he know. How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? He did know letters. In fact, he says, I am the first letter in God's alphabet. I am Alpha. And he said, I am the last letter in God's alphabet. I'm Omega. And I'm all the letters in between. I am the letters that make up the word. And I am the words that make up the sentences. And I am the one that brings forth the continuity of the expression of God in his scriptures. The word letters here, if you look at Romans chapter 2, you'll see the same word, Greek word used there. Romans chapter 2. In verse 26, if the uncircumcision, that is the Gentiles, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his physical uncircumcision be counted for spiritual circumcision? circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. That Gentile is going to judge that Jew to be uncircumcised because God's not just talking about the physical aspect of the law, but the spiritual aspect of the law. <clears throat> For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. If that's all you got, then you are breaking the law of God. For God said, <clears throat> my words are spirit and they are life. Why is that? Because God is spirit. What's that got to do with it? Because the word was God the same was in the beginning with God. So the word has to be spirit because God is a spirit or is spirit and the word is spirit. So we do not approach him with do's and don'ts and regulations. We approach him with an obedient heart. Wherein the spiritual aspect of God's word is accomplished in us by regenerating grace. It's not I that live this life, but Christ that liveth in me. If I study the Bible and I have not the life of Christ living in me, then the Bible itself tells me that knowledge puffeth up. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. And the Bible that I'm trying to keep <clears throat> also tells me, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, Knowledge shall cease. But what is it that shall endure forever? And yet I show unto you a more excellent way, and it is the love of God. For now abideth faith, and now abideth hope. But the greatest of these that shall abide forever is love, because God is love. So I'm thankful for faith, I'm thankful for hope, but I have to have the love of God to use those things until I can be brought into the presence of God forever. I'm thankful for the written word, <clears throat> I'm thankful for knowledge, I'm thankful for studying, but I understand that without the love of God, 
that is going to vanish away and I'll be left without anything. And I know that without the love of God in my heart, that knowledge that I am obtaining will fill me with pride and I will miss at the responsibility of the glory. <clears throat> That's one of the things that Jesus said, you can know the doctrine and you will know that you're walking with God in the revelation of Christ is how the man handles the glory. So we come to understand that this is all tied in together. How knoweth this man letters? You're barking up the wrong tree. He is not learned. Where'd you get that idea? Well, we went down to the rabbi school and we checked the roll and he's not on it. We looked to see how many diplomas had been handed out over the years and his name's not in there. He's not learned. But dear soul, he was the very content and the source of the word. And yet, they're going to miss him in studying the scriptures and condemning the word. <clears throat> For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Listen. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, and listen, and not in the letter. That's the same word they said, how knoweth this man letters. It's the same word in verse 27, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. So he's saying it's not of the letter and that you can have the letter and still transgress the law and be circumcised as well. God is spirit. We can't approach the spirit of God with religious performance and religious concepts. We have got to have the cross of Jesus Christ break us from works of righteousness done by legalistic compliance to a set of rules. We've got to be brought to the feet of the person of the word and have the spirit of the word manifest himself to us. She gets a letter every week from over in the east where her soldier husband is stationed and she sits down and reads it. <clears throat> her mother living with her or her living with her mother comes and said, let me read one of John's letters. She said, you wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to you because when he writes, knowing him intimately and being one with him, there is a spirit of this letter. And as it were, I read between the lines. She has been made one flesh with John. The mother may have birthed him, but she doesn't have the same relationship as does the wife. What is the commandment? Leave your mother, leave your father, and submit, that's the word, submit yourself to your mate, and those two shall be one flesh. The relationship of the husband and the wife supersede the relationship of the mother to the son, or the father and mother to the bride. It overtakes all other relationships, and if you don't believe that, you try to live with your mother-in-law for a while in her house till yours gets built. And you'll find out as close as, as you are related, there's a difference between everybody else and your husband or your bride. So she reads the letters and she can reread them. And we say, you know, I read that over again that I had not read in months, that passage, that chapter, that book of the Bible. And there was more came from it this time than ever I had known before. Why? 
because you had increased in the spirit of fellowship with the Lord, that I may know him. How? In the fellowship of his sufferings. You hadn't suffered as much then when you first went through it as you have now. Now, through many trials, dangers, toils, and snares, you have already come. And the word that you studied years ago is now opened up to you again, and you begin to understand and see more about your precious husband, your heavenly husband, Christ, than ever you did before, because now you have become more in oneness with him. So your knowledge doesn't puff you up because it's not a bare, simplistic accumulation of information. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. This is life eternal, that they may know thee. There is a knowing of God above, apart, aside from the knowing of religion. If I only know religion, I can have a birth in hell next to Judas. But if I know Christ, I will never see death of any kind. But I will be in eternal glory in the presence of the Holy Lamb of God. Dear soul, get all the education, all the the impartation of godly information you can get, but make sure that you get it on your knees, looking for nothing other than what the Greeks sought for when they said, sirs, we would see Jesus. So the circumcision of the Jew, and if they wasn't circumcised, God said, I'm going to cut them off. If it is not also with the understanding of the need of circumcising the heart, the operation of the Holy Spirit in mortification, accompanying regeneration, life in regeneration, death to self, continually dying, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, if it, is, if it does not come with the work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, dear soul, it will, it will turn you aside from the glory of God. Being ignorant is not spiritual, but neither is being intellectual. Being ignorant does not, and unlearned does not, separate you from God's presence and His grace. The teacher came to me this morning and said, didn't know if I could get it across to my children or not. I said, my sister, it's not by education, it's not by illumination, it's by revelation. But if it's by revelation, the other two will be brought in and sanctified. And I said, my sister, now you know my heart. I know what I see, but I don't know how to get it to thee. That's not my job. My job, as far as I can tell, Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 4, this is what Jesus commanded his prophet. This is what the Lord commanded his prophet. And if he commanded his prophet to do it, he had to do the same thing because he, he cannot give us a word that he himself will not obey. I saw a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass. Ezekiel 40 and verse 3. Not only was he brilliant and brassy like in his determination and his fixedness not to be turned aside, but he also had a line of flax in his hand to measure that which was outside of him. And he stood in the gate. If you're going in, you're going to have to go by this man with the appearance of brass that has a measuring line in his hand. 
And the man said unto me, Son of man, you just another human being of yourself. This is what I want you to do. Number one, behold with thine eyes. He that seeth the Son and believeth on him hath life. Behold with thine eyes. I want you to open the eye gate. Absorb all that you can. The heavens declare the glory of God. You need to see God in all things round about. And hear with thine ears. Faith cometh through this gate. For faith cometh by hearing. And hearing comes by Word of God. What does that mean? It means Lazarus ain't coming out if me and you call him out. Because who calls him out has got to give him an ear in order to hear. And then life in order to come forth. So faith is the one that gives the hearing. And the hearing in faith of the person of the word is that which brings life to you. And then set thine heart upon I have found by experience that those things that I came to the pulpit with, that to me were just theory. It was just sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, but sometimes it made me look like I knew what I was doing to sound that brass and tinkle that cymbal. What's your point, preacher? If I don't believe in it, then I can't expect you to believe in it. Set your heart upon it. Is your heart set upon it? Is your heart set upon just successful preaching? Or is your heart set upon what you're looking at and what you're hearing? If your heart is set upon Christ, dear soul, then you can expect Christ to set the people's hearts upon him as well. But if your heart ain't set upon it, if it don't mean very much to you, it won't mean very much to anybody else. Whether you ever get an education as far as schooling in churchanity and theology or not, the one thing you need to make sure you get is a heart that's set upon God. And set thy heart upon how much of it? Well, you know, we don't believe this Revelation chapter 9. I'm just kidding. Roman chapter 9, we're going to cut that out. No. You don't get to pick and choose. I remember the first time I preached, preached on sovereign election and predestination, Diane crawled under the bench. It was scary. But I didn't have an, a choice. This is what God gave me. That's what I had to preach. Set thy heart upon all that I will show thee. Now listen. You little knucklehead, this is the only reason I brought you here. Son of man... For to the intent that I might show them unto thee, art thou brought hither. You, listen, your mama didn't have a baby boy that became a preacher. Your mama had a baby preacher that was a boy. The only reason you're in this world, the only reason you're taking up space, the only reason you're eating my plants and animals and breathing my air and drinking my water is because I brought you here to say what I want you to say. See what I want you to see. To hear what I want you to hear. And how much of this am I I'm supposed to declare? I'm supposed to hear. I'm supposed to set my heart upon, upon. I'm supposed to behold with my eyes. And I'm supposed to understand that there's no other reason for my life. And then what am I supposed to do with it? Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. I was at a church in northeast Alabama one time, and I had a particular message, and two or three messages, I preached two or three nights over there, and, and I knew it was not setting well with the game. And uh, I think they were so much happier to see me leave than they was to see me come. And it was like months later, I was back in the presence of the pastor and his wife, and his wife come up to me and said, I want to tell you something. I thought, well, here we go, you know, facing get stabbed. She said, I didn't get what you were saying until weeks after you left. 
And I thought, yeah, I know. Did you notice in this verse what it doesn't say? It doesn't say, and everybody's going to understand what I told you. God didn't want them to get it from me. God wanted them to get it from God. And she said, I thought you had denied everything we believed in. I thought that was the craziest stuff I'd ever heard. I just couldn't, I, I, I just couldn't believe you was, you was preaching like you was until finally God began to turn my mind and show me what you were saying. And it, you were saying the same thing from a different angle of what we'd ever heard it from. And God opened up more of himself to me than I had had, had up to that point. And I said, thank you, Lord. You kept me out of it. Mm. So how knoweth this man's, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Uh, this, old, this word letters is the same word scriptures in 2 Timothy 3.16. It's the same word written, W-R-I-T-T-E-N, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse number 7. In Luke 24, verses 44 and 45, Jesus showed them all things concerning himself in Moses, in the Psalms, and all the scriptures of the prophets. Everything was about him. Every letter, every jot, every tittle, everything about it is about him. And they're asking, how does he know letters seeing he hadn't been schooled in our, in our schools of the rabbis. They, like Nicodemus, didn't understand what a true preacher was. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. What is your basis of measurement? And what is the, your criteria of determining who's a preacher? Because no man can do these miracles that thou doest. Jesus just looked at him and says, hey, no, since me wasting my time on you, son, you need to be born again. You need to start at the beginning. You, you don't even know God. You haven't seen the kingdom and you haven't entered the kingdom. Unless you're born again, you don't understand that these two things God gave us in chapter 7 of John and verses 17 and 18 are the two things by which Christians down through the ages where they had this scripture in their lap and ever owned their Bible or not, always had by the Holy Spirit to be able to know how to walk with God in the doctrine of God. If you're willing to do His will, and He has made His people willing in the day of His power, you shall know the doctrine. You know that song, Trust and Obey? Give me another line. Trust and Obey for? Don't sing that if you don't believe this verse. There is no other way. Do you, read, do you hear what Brother Gary read us this morning in Matthew, I mean this afternoon in Matthew 28? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. You don't go out here preaching the word without obeying it yourself. That's how the effectual word of God is passed on from one generation to another. To another. First of all, let's establish. What is the gospel? The former things have I made known to thee, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. What was the former treaty that he wrote? The book of Luke. What else is another word for? What is another word for the book of Luke? It is the gospel. So the gospel is what Jesus did and taught. So the way that the gospel is going to be passed on from generation to generation is you do, apostles, what I told you to do while preaching and they will begin to do and to preach and there it goes. And it will be generated from faith to faith. This apostle believing it, preaching it, his faith will be caught up by the hearer and the Holy Spirit will quicken the hearer and he will begin to see it and by faith he'll begin to live it and preach it and here it comes all the way down to a cow pasture in 2014 on the backside of, of, of this property in Jonesboro, Georgia. That's how you got it. 
People want to know how to be successful. That's not an issue with God. Picture God unsuccessful. Ugh, you give me a headache. I can't. Good. So that's what I'm talking about. It's not even an issue with God. Well done, thou good and faithfulness is the issue with God. God can't be unsuccessful. Dear soul, if you set your heart upon, after seeing it with your eyes, hearing it with your ears, and if you declare all of that to the house of Israel, then the church will be continued on down through the ages. That's how it's done. How will anybody know whether this man is a man of God or not? My sheep hear my voice. If my sheep, Jesus, Jesus' sheep, hear his voice through another servant, called of God then they will follow that servant as long as he's following the Lord be ye followers of me as I am followers of Christ don't ever follow anybody that's not following Christ don't pin yourself on the coattail of any preacher just because he's one of us He's esteemed in the society of which our church is uh, membership with. Get out of every society except Jesus' society and you'll be all right. But Jesus' society will put you in fellowship with true believers wherever they are. God is good. I don't believe... That lack of education is spiritual. Folks, I have studied the scriptures seven, eight hours a week, five and six days a week for 39 years. If that ain't study, I don't know what it is. I didn't go down and put my name on a roll and Dr. Bottle stop and get up and teach me in a classroom. But a call to the ministry is a call to study. So I don't want you to think that I think that, that not studying is, is spiritual. Those guys used to say, I'm just opening the Bible anywhere, stick my finger on it, that's where I'm going to preach. And I said, let him open it to the concordance. <laughs> Teach him a lesson. <clears throat> Neither do I think that this assembly here is the only assembly with the voice of God in it. But I ain't responsible for all them other assemblies. If I don't act like and if I don't set my heart upon what I'm preaching, you ain't going to believe. Why would you believe it if I don't believe in it? So I'm intense about this thing. But I'm not, I, I don't believe in exclusivism. I, I, don't, I ain't been bit by the Elijah bug. I only am left of, God's got servants all over the place. A mighty God like him, having one servant? Yeah, I don't think so. But I'm responsible for this. I didn't volunteer for it. I got drafted. There's no other, there's, there's nothing else I can do. I've got to be faithful until the Lord says that's enough. So it's, 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 you have to be careful with knowledge because it does puff up. But we, are, we, we ought to endeavor to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We ought to rightly divide the word of truth. We ought to delve in this thing, Solomon says in Proverbs, like a man digs for silver in a silver mine. It's work. And it, it's worthy work. Now, Brother Jamie's is getting nervous, so go to the book of Amos. <clears throat> I appreciate you, Brother Jamie. I really do. 
chapter 7. And I want to say this while you're turning there. The source of the doctrine is the source of the calling. The, the way God calls you, He will fill you with Himself and His Word. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Preaching is to come from the sending. How learneth this man letters? He was sent of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? Okay. But how shall they preach except they be sent? The call of God into the ministry the voice of God saying to Christ, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, and in another place, hear him. That voice authenticates uh, his, his testimony and the doctrine that he preaches. And he tells him clearly, You're right. I haven't been to your rabbi schools, but I want you to know this. My doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. I do speak from myself. That's the title of our list. I speak from myself. But he spoke from the self that had heard the voice of God. And the preaching comes from the sending. And it, it says in Amos chapter 7, in verse number 10, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, Gentlemen, tell them again what Bethel stands for. House of God. House of God. Amaziah was the White House prophet. The priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam. What was he? King. king of Israel. He's right in there with the king. Dear soul, you're going to preach from the standpoint of your fellowship. Amaziah preached for Jeroboam because he fellowship with him because he was king but Amos preached from God because God called him and sent him forth and he walked with the Lord saying Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel and boy you're talking about really loading up this thing he, he makes this statement the land is not able to bear all his words Boy, that'd be good if it was true, wouldn't it? As far as Amos is concerned. For thus saith, for thus Amos saith. And there's always somebody that's re ready to paraphrase your, I didn't get that word right there, paraphrase your message. And you know what? They'll pull out a sentence or two and, and make you look like an idiot. Uh, Mark Carpenter did that to me years and years and years ago, and it's still on the internet. Go to outside the camp. He took a message that his daughter, that his sister, in the printing business, thought it was so great. She typed it up word for word, transcribed it, and put it in a booklet and published it. And he's sitting right there next to her, hating me, and takes out just one little sentence at a time and makes me say stuff I never believed, and got it on the internet, and we ain't never gonna get it off. You can make a man an offender for a word. That's what the book says. If people hate God, they will make sure that they justify themselves in leaving your membership by picking out something to grind in and say, that's why I'm leaving. No, it wasn't. You lying devil. You left because you didn't like the truth. And you're just trying to find something to justify you in leaving. And as ignorant and pitiful as I am, there's plenty of stuff you can find about me personally, but you can't find anything against the gospel I preach. Listen. For thus Amos saith. This, I'm going to tell you what, what he said. Did you listen to that tape, King? No, I didn't get to hear it. All right, well, I'll tell you what he said. 
Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. What's the next word? Verse 12. Just in case that didn't work. Plan B was not only to smear him to the king, but also to try to get him aside, put on your royal, you know, robes and your little curled up silk, uh, silk sandals and your, your poker on your head, you know, hat on your head and all your lace and your, all that stuff and ride into Pope Mobile and razzle dazzle him with all your glory. Get him over here. Come here, country boy. Also, just in case slandering him to the king don't work, then you try to undermine his confidence. Also, Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer, sarcastic, wasn't he? You think you are a seer. You think you're a prophet. You see everything. Call you by what you think you are. Being just really antagonistic. To o thou seer, go. Flee thee away into the land of Judah. All you are is a hireling priest anyhow, prophet anyhow. That's, you just want to be able to make enough money by preaching to buy your bread. Go prophesy there and, and get your vittles. But listen. But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. What's that word mean? House of God. Now, what does Amaziah say it means? But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. For it is the... Did he mention God? Did he mention God's house? He said the word Bethel, but he didn't know what it meant. He hadn't ever set his heart upon the glory. Don't prophesy anymore here at Bethel, which means the house of God. Well, Amaziah, tell me what you think of when you hear the word Bethel. For it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Go away, country boy. You, you out of your lead. You up here in, in high cotton. You up here at Bethel. And he'd already tra transformed in his mind the word Bethel to mean the king's court and the king's palace or king's chapel. And he was totally forgetful of Bethel, meaning the house of God. He tells him to prophesy not again in verse 13. Guess what Amos does beginning in verse 14? He starts prophesying. He starts preaching. Let me ask you something. If, if you're in a war and you ain't got but one weapon, what do you make sure you uh, always keep and use all the time? That one weapon. The soldier of the Lord has got one weapon. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is one thing that Amaziah, stepping in God's place, tells Amos he can't do anymore. You need to be very careful. You may not like this old country boy, Amos, you may, he may be an aggravation to you. He may remind you of the time when you had opportunity to go with the spirit of this thing, but you decided like Judas, you love the money and you'd like to go and be the White House prophet. So you throw God out and you thought everything was going just fine and then this country bumpkin shows up and starts preaching everywhere and it reminds you what... What of your sin and how you cast God off? Mm -mm. Hast thou come to call my sin to remembrance, the water said to the prophet. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. There was a time when I hadn't been called, but now I am. When I started out, I didn't have any ambition to be a prophet. I wasn't called to be a prophet. There was a time when, I, not like you, you've always polished yourself and wanted to get in there and be recognized as the religious hobnob with the king. Neither was I a prophet's son. Look in my pedigree. 
This thing's not handed down from father to son in the, in the physical. My daddy wasn't no prophet. We, we didn't make any, any issue about it at all that, that, that we ever thought we would be prophets or have a prophet among our house, our household. But I was a herdman. Hmm. Ye are my people and the blank of my pasture. Sheep. Surely the Lord's anointed stands before him, they said to Samuel, as one of the finest of Jesse's sons stood there. He said, no, nope. the Lord ain't called this man either. He said, you got any more sons? He said, yeah, but he's out there keeping the sheep. Uh-oh. I was a herdman. Wonder what he was learning that prepared him for going to preach in the, in the, in the king's court uh, and in the king's chapel that shook up the pope so bad. He learned the ways of God by taking care of the herd. Hmm. He must have set his eyes upon it. He must have had his heart open to it. He must have heard God speaking. There's that, that, that you was trying to birth that lamb. He must have heard the bellowing of, 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 of that heifer as she was giving birth to a calf. There must have been some goring of the horns with some of those bullies in there that wanted to uh, have all the water for their self and stomp down the water and made it mud so the others couldn't drink. He must have learned a lot of things about God because he went from a herdsman to a prophet because at one time he wasn't no prophet. His daddy wasn't a prophet. They never talked about anybody being a prophet. They talked about how to be a better cowboy. Herdsman, all right? But I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what that is. But anyhow, it's fruit. And he gathered it. And that's what he did. So he was a farmer, and he took care of livestock. Now listen at the next few words. And the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, took me. When? As I followed the flock. Almighty God, the I Am, took me as I followed the flock. What are you doing? I'm just taking care of this flock. You know, God would not let David come around to the throne and take care of God's sheep until he first Learn how to take care of Jesse's sheep. Not only did the Lord took me, but the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. That's it. What he said from that point on came from that schooling that God had given him in following the herds and picking the sycamore fruit in submission and obedience to his father who never did try to promote him to being a preacher. There's a heap of mama called preachers, folks. But he, he wasn't prompted by his family. God took him and God said, go prophesy unto my people Israel. All right. Listen to the first three words in verse 16. Now, therefore, hear. What did he tell him to quit doing? Quit preaching. Prophesy not again anymore. Verse 13. So he says, that's how it happened. And here is the result of that. Now, therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Still all capital letters. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Let me tell you what God said. 
I'm not going to tell you what I said. All I'm going to say about me, I've already said. I wasn't a prophet. My daddy wasn't a prophet. I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. That's all I'm going to tell you about me. But I'm going to tell you this. My message is in my calling. I can't not go. The Lord sent me here, and I've got to do what God said. And since you're telling me directly not to do what God told me directly to do, you have set yourself up as being the enemy of God, and you have set yourself up as, as my God and saying, I don't care what you thought that other God told you to do. I'm telling you to stop doing it. So you just got me out of the picture. I'll step back now. You and God are going to have to deal with this thing, find out which one of them is really right or not. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city. Thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. And thy land shall be divided by line. They're going to sit down there and slice it up. And thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his, hand, of, of his land. Wow. How knoweth this man letters? He is the letter, the Alpha and Omega. He is the Word. God would have all of those that he foreloved prior to angelic beings existing, prior to A-T-O-M's or A-D-A-M's, his love for all those that he saw in his son, electing them, he had determined that they would be brought to him. And he sent forth one person, his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that which our hands have handled and our ears have heard, our hands have touched, our eyes have seen, that is the Word of God, the Word Himself is manifest forth to us and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. It's the glory of the Father. And every last one of them, no matter how many Amaziahs has said, Stop that! I'm going to tell the king on you and get you in trouble. I'm going to lie on you and tell him that you're guilty of insurrection. You're, you're guilty of treason. If that don't work, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to get in your face and make you feel like an idiot. Because you ain't got all these high muckety-muck diplomas and things like I got. He said, I got one thing you ain't counted on. He said, what's that? God took me. God said... Go. Have you ever seen in the history of the universe God to tell anything to do something and it didn't do it? Let there be light. What's the next? What's the result? And there was light. Zacchaeus come down out of that tree. Guess what? He got, spl he got splinters in his britches getting down out of that tree. Listen, everything God said he did. And when God told this man to go, he knew Amos' eye was over there waiting on him before Amos ever knew he existed. And all Amos had to do, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Whether they considered it to be a rebuke or an exaltation, exhortation, it don't matter. Just do what I told you to do. And I'll take care of all the rest of it. But know this, Anybody that sets herself up against that calling, they're going to have to face God for theirself. The prophet Isaiah said, "How long, O Lord?" He said, "I want you to go preach." He said, "Okay." He said, "But they ain't going to hear." He said, "What?" He said, "Not going to hear you." He said, "I want you to go tell them, but they're not going to obey." And he said, well, how long have I got to do this? He said, till there ain't nobody left to preach to. Till the houses be desolate. Until you've preached yourself out of a job, you, you got to keep on doing what God told you to do. Isn't that right? How knoweth this man letters? What an absurd thing to say about the person of the Word of God. 
Isn't that amazing? Christians, I, you, I've already zipped up my Bible. I'm through. But you know how I am. I already got to put a tail on the end of it. John 7, 17 and 18. Please, for your sakes, read it again sometime this week. Read it again. Don't read it as Brother Gene's message. Read it as God's word to you. Two things he assures you that will maintain the truth of the word of God in your soul. Mm. Obedience and proper relationship to the glory. And you'll be all right. And then I'll be all right about you. <laughs>